Ed. Really excited. Thank you. And I'm actually, I say this every time, and I'll say it again, and I'll, I'll continue to say it. Uh, out of all of you, I'm the person who gets the most value out of this. I really am. Uh, I'm not just saying that. I get a ton of value out of being here. Uh, and the only reason why I get any value out of it at all is because you guys show up. Uh, and so I really just appreciate you all coming down. There are over 600 people in the PeopleSide meetup now. Uh, a year later, and you guys keep showing up, and we get great people to come and talk. This is our first people side with a panel, so I'm excited to do that. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming down. Uh, I will plug myself one more time. Uh, as I've told you through the meetup group, and I'll tell you again now, uh, I'm not consulting anymore, and what I'm doing is actually I'm starting a new venture called The Scaffold, and if you're interested in it, please come. Uh, Talk with me about it afterwards. I will talk your ear off, I promise, uh, all about that. And definitely go and sign up, check it out. I would love to have you guys tell me what you think, give me some feedback. It's early and new and not uh, where it will be, but I'm happy to have it up and would love your feedback. Uh, thank you to the uh, thank you to Spotify uh, and people operations at Spotify. Uh, they provided us with the, the food, the dumplings, the, the drinks, uh, this is actually the fanciest people side we've had. <laughs> it's also, uh, I'm not shy about saying this, I'm, I bet I've said it to you guys and I've said it to a bunch of you in the audience. The Spotify office, I think, is the nicest office in New York Tech. Thank you. It is just a beautiful space and you guys didn't even get to see half of it. Uh, they have a whole other side over there which is beautiful. They have rooftop access. Uh, they put on uh, music events sometimes here, and I think they're going to be doing that on the roof once it's finished and, and the weather's nice. Possibly, yes. uh, it is just a spectacular space. Uh, great company, uh, great people on the people operations team. If you haven't had the chance, they're incredibly approachable. Uh, all three of these people on the stage are wonderful people, smart, uh, think very deeply about what we all care about, which is the people side of the organization. So uh, give it up for them for just a second. Thank you guys so much for hosting. I will start quickly and then I'll sit down. Uh, just wanted to say tonight we're, we're having the, the people side with Spotify. Uh, we have Matt, Jonas, and Becky. Uh, Matt, Jonas, and Becky make up people operations at Spotify for the New York office. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but Spotify was founded about six years ago. It's a Swedish-born company. Uh, they still have headquarters in Sweden, so there are Spotify people operations in Sweden as well. In fact, I think we have at least one person from Spotify's people operations. There we go. From Sweden there, from headquarters, uh, in the room tonight, visiting. Uh, and this is the, the New York office, so the headquarters in Stockholm, where the, bunch of, uh, the bulk of the engineering office is done. New York is the second biggest hub, and it's really rapidly growing. Uh, Spotify is hiring if you guys are engineers and you're looking for work, Spotify is a great place to work. Uh, you should definitely speak with uh, the people on stage or uh, other people from the Stockholm office as well. Paolo. Paolo, Paolo sorry, I forgot your name, Paolo. Um, yeah, and Spotify is becoming a really important part of our community, the New York tech community, so thank you guys so much for having us. I'm going to sit down, and the first thing I'm gonna ask uh, from all of you is just to, to give us some, some background on how each of you got here. Uh, sure, hello. Yes, this is working. Uh, hi, my name uh, is Matt O'Leary. I'm the uh, head of people operations here in the, in the US. Um, I have a background in, uh, in technology and project management and uh, agile coaching and um, organizational development um, and operational improvement initiatives and things like that with various technology companies uh, and startups in uh, in the US and in Australia, where I'm, where I'm from. Uh, I also have a bit of a background in um, managing bands in the music industry uh, in Australia. I spent some years working with a bunch of really talented musicians at various companies that uh, were highly unorganized with pretty much anything else other than actually playing music. Uh, so I spent a few years um, helping them get organized and, and uh, sign record labels and, and tour uh, around Melbourne as uh, where I'm from, uh, and then 
uh, yeah, that sort of yeah, took a couple of years in my, in my spare time. Uh, I moved to New York about uh, two or three years ago. Uh, I signed up for a uh, Spotify premium account within about three hours of arriving uh, in the US and uh, immediately started looking for ways to, to get a job at Spotify. Um, so after several months of uh, sort of researching and uh, LinkedIn stalking uh, and creative networking and a couple of chance sort of uh, opportunistic meetings with people, um, found out about people operations. Uh, and after several months of several conversations and many, 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 many interviews, uh, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I started here in, in people operations uh, a little over a year ago, which uh, was the perfect combination for me of all the things that I've done in the past, um, all the things that I'm passionate about, um, technology and music, especially the music side of things, um, and all the things that I'm interested in doing in terms of helping grow uh, an organization. Great. So. Thanks. Jonas? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jonas, uh, and it sounds like a song. Uh, I'm from... Uh, <laughs> I'm from Sweden, uh, so my Starbucks name is Paul. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, so sorry about this. <laughs> uh, my story is uh, I I studied uh, applied physics and electrical engineering and psychology and education, uh, which sounds like a great thing to put in your online date, online dating profile. Um, but after that, I I started working uh, at Ericsson as a software develop, developer. And that was great. Uh, I, I had great fun. I, I managed to well, be productive and, and get a lot of things done. Uh, and then after two years, I moved to another department within Ericsson. And all of a sudden, I was fairly useless, uh, which was interesting because it was the same job title. It was, I had the st still the same skill set, uh, but the environment was completely di different. So I sort of realized that the most important factor in my previous performance was basically the environment and the mm. system which, within which I operated. So I started working on organizational uh, improvement instead. So I spent two more years uh, roughly the same way, uh, being a software developer on paper. Uh, in reality, just being a pain in the ass, uh, <laughs> coming up with these great ideas. Uh, oh, we should do it like this instead. Uh, and. Then I, I found this uh, people operations ad, which was basically what I had been doing, but now I would get paid for it um, <laughs> properly. So I, I applied, and uh, yeah, I've been here ever since. Can you, can you say quickly uh, how, you, uh, how you developed the skill set to go from being an engineer uh, to someone who was working in people operations? That's just very interesting to me. Um, <laughs> I, I think you can... I think you can learn anything if you're just motivated to do it. I, I went from loving my job to hating it, uh, and I just felt I needed to do something about it. Uh, so, it's, so that's how I ended up. Just follow your passion. Yeah, that's what you did. It's great. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Becky Sandler. I studied marketing and business in school, including some organizational behavior and economics but I don't actually have a background in computer science beyond having a lot of friends who are software engineers who would complain to me about their work when we were out drinking. And uh, when I moved to New York, I got a job in market research and I found myself complaining a lot about that. And so a friend of mine uh, who had worked with Matt at a previous job brought me to a Hack Week party here at Spotify where I met a lot of the people who I now work with and I started bugging Matt about wanting to work at Spotify. And when something... That is, that is a true story. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, when something opened up, he had no choice but to pick me. Now, you said Hack Week. I know that when I, I came around earlier in the month, you guys were having a Hack Week as well. Say something about what is Hack Week at Spotify? Hack Week at Spotify is when you cancel all of your meetings and you try to find people who are interested in solving a problem that you share or they, you want to try something but it's not planned yet and you just want to see if it can work and it can mean anything and the whole company does it, marketing, technology, people operations and then at the end everyone presents all of their cool ideas and some of them come to reality and some of the ideas um, are small enough that you can finish them within a week and they're part of the office or a part of Spotify now. 
I'm gonna put you guys on the spot for half a second. I want a quick three-word answer, and, and if anybody's interested in, in hearing more about their answers, you can ask them afterwards. Favorite Hack Week projects? That we did or that other people did? Anyone, anyone at Spotify, anywhere. What is the most awesome Hack Week project? We had an engineer who made a machine which was like tinfoil and an Arduino board and a Raspberry Pi that he programmed to play harder, better, faster, stronger by Daft Punk by pressing the different <laughs> pieces. And you could see the commands on the Raspberry Pi on the screen behind him as he played the song. And it was really cool. That's pretty freaking awesome. Go for it. I, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, in the most recent Hack Week, there was a, one of our developers in Stockholm developed, uh, no, it was here actually, wasn't it? Um, uh, an app, um, and I, forget, I can't really talk to the technology or the, the engineering part of it, but um, uh, an app that was a, a, a sound sensor that um, changed the music based on the uh, rhythm or the speed that you clapped. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so the faster you clapped, it would change the, yeah, nice. change the music, yeah. It was pretty cool. Awesome. Uh, and the, also the latest Hack Week, uh, someone in Stockholm built a exercise bike uh, that changed the speed of, 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 of the music, of music. Oh. Um, with, with your pedaling. So. so if you're like taking a spin class and you have your headphones in, if you're really going at it, it's going to make you really want to go at it. Yeah, and you could, you could pre-adjust the, the, the tempo and the speed to whatever rhythm you wanted to go. So. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, back, to, back to our previously scheduled programming. Uh, with one of you, uh, tell me a little bit about what people operations is. So there's a lot of different names that we use for this space that we're all in. Sometimes uh, people identify as HR or talent or people or people operations. Uh, can you say a bit about, about what people operations is at Spotify and why that name? So uh, people operations, uh, or POPs as we call it sometimes, uh, has always been responsible for building and retaining uh, the best product development team in the world. Now, that's a fairly broad mission. Uh, what that has meant over the years uh, has been, I mean, first we needed to focus on, on growing the team. So we started off focusing on, on our recruitment efforts, trying to build a a recruitment machine, basically, a, a well-functioning recruitment process. After that, it quickly became a focus to get an onboarding process working, because there was a lot of people coming in, uh, and also working with changing the organizational model to, to fit these in. Um, after that, we switched focus again to um, to help uh, managers within this new organization, uh, to give them the support and the tools they needed to, to do a good job. Uh, and now, we've changed focus again. Uh, having Now we have a lot of people who have been here for a couple of years, two, three, four years. So professional development is, is a focus now to, to keep people engaged and interested in, and, and making sure they want to stay here and yep. finding new challenges for those who need that. And so it sounds very similar to the work that traditional HR does. Can you talk about your relationship with the HR department at Spotify, which is a separate organization, right? Yeah, that's a separate organization. We, we're in, within the technology organization. And you could look at uh, POPs as sort of a specialized, specialized HR team. Uh, and we work with the technology product and, and design. And we're basically trying to, to make this a better and better workplace uh, each day. HR, they have uh, a broader set of responsibilities and for the entire company. So they sort out things that we never have to sort of worry about. It, salaries, for instance, they get paid and that's good. <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, so Spotify, you mentioned the, the redesign, right? You guys were, were uh, crucial for that redesign, and you guys really are, are scaling Agile to the entire company, uh, at least uh, at least in the development side of the company, which is a large part of the company. Um, it's fascinating to me that the first introduction outside of the product, which I love, uh, outside of the product, my first introduction to the company at Spotify was that document you all created around scaling Agile uh, to a whole company. Uh, I would love to hear one of you talk about 
uh, the origins of that, how did that come about, how do you work through that? Uh, talk about scaling Agile to the company. Um, so just to, just to be uh, perfectly honest, we, we didn't contribute to that particular document. It was made by one of our uh, Agile coaches in, uh, in Stockholm, um, and it was published on TechCrunch. Uh, I think about two years ago. What was his name? Might as well give him his props. Uh, Hen yeah, Henrik. Uh, Henrik uh, Nieberg. Good um, job, Henrik. It's, uh, and uh, so the, we, we do have a very strong uh, Agile culture here at Spotify. Uh, in the very early days, we, we were, um, and before my time, we had a very strong Scrum implementation uh, when the company was quite young, and we've since kind of evolved and pivoted from uh, having, I guess, a traditional sort of Scrum model to, uh, or Scrum master model to Agile coaching. Um, which is, uh, I guess, philosophically different in the sense that we, the Agile coaches will uh, kind of float from team to team and help them sort of uh, improve and, and um, uh, optimize for effectiveness and efficiency um, as opposed to being sort of um, permanently embedded in, in the team. Um, but the, the document that you talk of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we've been amazed how, how successful that has been and, and how prominent in the... Uh, in the technology uh, world, but also outside of the technology world. I have some friends uh, back in Australia in banking and finance and consulting who often refer to that um, uh, when they're trying to either evolve or implement uh, Agile at, uh, at various organisations. So it's, and we get emails and letters and phone calls from people all the time telling us different companies in different countries and different sectors and industries have, have started to use that, or at least the, the fundamentals from, from that document um, uh, to, to help them sort of implement Agile. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, internally at Spotify, we've, we've had a, a really good success story in, uh, with our tech recruiting team here in the US and our, our tech recruiting practice of um, uh, rolling out uh, or basically helping them uh, adopt some Agile principles. So about a, a year ago, um, a little bit after I started, um, we had a, a small semi-functional uh, recruiting team here in the US. Uh, we were on the cusp of, of expanding rapidly. We had a huge hiring, um, hiring needs over the, the coming, coming year. Um, but there was not a lot of alignment with the, with the business needs and a lot of understanding of, of what, was, what was really needed, um, and particularly around priorities, for, for hiring priorities. So we, we worked very closely with the recruiting team. Um, uh, they weren't sure even what Agile was. They didn't really know what all these post-it notes that the, the developers were putting up all over the walls and the windows and, and whiteboards and, and stuff like that. Uh, so bit by bit, we just started to show them the value of just simple visualization of, of um, the recruiting pipeline and workflow. Um, and a, a, they had a, a backlog or, um, of different process improvement initiatives they wanted to undertake to help them be better recruiters and help them understand the business needs better. And bit by bit, they evolved that process um, and uh, with a, a simple workflow, a visualization workflow, um, and then got help from some of the other Agile coaches within the, the company. And over the next three to six months, um, uh, they all studied very hard, they learned, they mentored with different people um, and really took on uh, a really strong sense of Agile and um, uh, lean practices and Kanban practices. And, and right now, they're just uh, in the other wing, they have, I think, probably the best looking Kanban board in the entire company. Can you, for, yes. for the people that, in the audience that aren't familiar with Agile and Kanban boards, can you high level say what a Kanban board is and how that uh, fits in the process? Yeah, sure. Look, at a very high level, and um, I'm happy to have this conversation offline uh, in more detail, but uh, the, the basic principle behind Kanban is just visualizing your work and, and being able to really effectively see your, your work in, work in progress um, and, and visualize where some of the bottlenecks might be. Um, and uh, a key element to that is, is limiting the work in progress or the, or the WIP limit as it's uh, often referred to. Um, so the recruiting team had this massive backlog of 50 or 60 different post-it notes of things that they wanted to improve or work on or adopt, um, but you can't work on 50 or 60 different things at, at any one point in time. So uh, we went through a prioritization exercise and, and helped them basically limit the work they were doing at any one point in time. They had a separate flow, or they have a separate flow now for the recruiting pipeline for different technology needs or business needs that we have. Um, it takes up about four or five yards of a wall. It's, it's mm. huge, um, but Im impeccably detailed. And um, from a year ago when they didn't even know what these terms even meant to um, having daily stand-ups and, and um, four or five key areas of their board visualized and really efficient, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah, I was, I'm always impressed when I, when I sit and speak with you. Um, so Matt has a, a background where he's done this scaling agile basically in other companies as well. Um, 
and I love that you, you talk about the ability to move around uh, like a warehouse, and you can see finance and legal, and, and, and if the whole organization is working with the same process, you can actually see what's going on uh, at a high level for any individual function. Uh, yeah. So I, I worked at a travel publishing company, Lonely Planet, in Australia for a few years, and um, I was one of many, many people who helped uh, or had a, played a role in the um, implementation of Agile um, outside of the development and, and sort of technical practices. And uh, we had this big warehouse that was kind of hollow in the middle, um, and at various points you could stand in the office and see most of the walls, most of the outside walls. Um, and after a year or two of um, working with legal and finance and IT and HR and business support, um, you could actually see, uh, you could walk around the office and actually get a, a glimpse to what every single team was doing at any point in time. We had a, uh, a consistent um, sort of colour pattern for different things they were doing and a, a different, um, a sort of consistent um, way to visualise the workflow. Um, yeah, and it was, it was brilliant, just the, again, simple visualisation of the work made a, such a big difference to alignment and transparency to what the company was up to. It sounds like it creates incredible alignment and transparency. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if uh, one of you, and, and Beck, you haven't spoken much, I'd love to hear from you uh, a bit about uh, more specifics in that document. So you guys have tribes and squads and, and there's I, other I, things. And I actually love explaining this. Yeah. Um, so the basic idea of how we scale Agile is to have autonomous teams that are about 10 people that we call squads. And those teams are cross-functional, so you've got front-end developers, you've got an agile coach, a product owner, a QA person, all sitting in the same room working towards one mission. And the easiest example in New York is that we have a tribe that is a bunch of different features that make Spotify a better product. So the tribe is the ads team, it's the people who work on radio, and also the people who run the Spotify website. So their overall mission is to make Spotify the product better. And then each squad has a smaller mission. So for example, we have two ad squads, but one does the front end and one does the back end. And then within those squads, in order to provide support for people and to get more communication, managers are called chapter leads and they have a chapter of people who share similar skills. So there's a chapter lead for web developers who manages and works with web developers to help them with professional development, understands what's going on in the different squads and communicates that with the tribe lead who looks over all of the different, the, all the different squads within a particular tribe. And then the chapters actually scale into a larger group called a guild. And we have guilds for front end developers, we have guilds for agile coaches, but what's really interesting about them is they're often just an email group where someone reads an interesting article about Agile, they'll send it out to the Agile Guild, or they'll have coffee once a week where they talk about challenges that people are facing, or they might have a conference, an unconference, once a year where they, they solve a particular problem. So we also have guilds that focus on priorities like continuous delivery, or we have guilds that are people who are interested in bettering our documentation and who just send around ideas and try to motivate each other and, and share best practices across the whole organization uh, that, allow, that allow us to be constantly improving. So for the people within this system, um, are they reporting, they're reporting to multiple people then? Well, Is that they're, we have the idea of servant leadership. Yeah. So there are a lot of people supporting them. Um, your, your chapter lead is the person that would do most traditional management things like, um, like 360 reviews that we have a whole system called loops for that. And you also work with an agile coach who helps your team, your squad, through software development processes and retrospectives and improving your practices. And then you have a product owner who helps guide your backlog. But you know the product owner is not saying what you're doing. The product owner is saying, I have this challenge. It's, it's our mission to solve this. Here's some of the things in your backlog. How can we make this happen as a team? So you're not reporting to a bunch of people. Yeah. You're really supported by them. That's great. Uh, and so Jonas, when you and I met, um, which is maybe six or seven months ago now, the first time we sat down, uh, 
I really enjoyed because you lit up when I asked you, how did this happen? <laughs> how did this come to be? Uh, and and you, it seemed to me that you really enjoyed talking about the, the origins of this model. And I'd love to hear that again. Uh, all right. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, no, but what happened was uh, back in two, uh, 2011 when we, when we started to, to grow rapidly, uh, it became apparent that the current organizational model wouldn't scale. Uh, it was very flat. That's not a bad thing per se, but uh, it was very flat and had some, uh, some bottlenecks. Uh, there were two people setting everyone's salary in the tech organization, for instance. Uh, a couple of more things like that. So we needed to, to figure out how could we, how could we change the organization uh, in order to allow for growth. So uh, we sat down with the uh, managers and the agile coaches uh, and, and, and thought about this and, and quickly realized that the functional unit the people actually doing work uh, is the, the Agile team. Uh, so whatever we come up with must support that unit. Uh, and through some discussions and trial and error and, 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 and so on, we came up with this, uh, with this tri model that um, Becky described. And, and it's basically just another way of supporting the, uh, what we now call squad. I really like that you guys are, are framing this. Everything about it is about supporting the people doing the work. It really is about just creating the environment that lets them uh, execute as well as they can. That's, at least that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about uh, what you've seen as the strengths of the system and, and some of the drawbacks as well? So some of the strengths, I would say that the tribe system helps us uh, it, it enables uh, autonomy. Uh, the tribes are organized so that every tribe has sort of a, a subset of the overall business problem that they are responsible for. And within that tribe, the squads have the autonomy to decide when to, to do the work, how to do it, and, and how to solve their, the, the problems that they are responsible for. It also enables uh, us to keep a sense of community uh, within the tribe. They are designed to be self-sustaining uh, and less than 150 people, so it's at least theoretically possible to, to know uh, who everyone in your own tribe uh, is. Uh, so that would be uh, what I count as... Uh, I, I'm Swedish, I'm forgetting words. <laughs> Strengths, thanks. Strengths. <laughs> That's a difficult Strengths. one. Um, <laughs> They're a great team. Um, should I talk about weaknesses? That would be great too. Uh, so <laughs> we, we like both sides of the. You can pass it off to anyone if you'd like. No, but, yeah. let me. I'm, <laughs> I'm halfway down here. So, um, since the the tribes are more or less designed to be silos, uh, it it sort of makes uh, it can make. Uh, communication <laughs> a little trickier. It uh, looks like someone started playing in our recording studio, which is just behind that wall there. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Sorry, it sounds like I should say. Yeah. Uh, no, it, so uh, communication ac across tribes becomes, uh, it, it can become tricky. Um, and, and the tribe is, that's the larger, uh, the larger group. So the 150, those are more tribes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, M maximum and, 150. Yeah. And so 150, the, that comes from the Dunbar number? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, I can do that, but why don't one of you guys uh, explain what, what the Dunbar number is, and the idea behind that. So the Dunbar number is the theoretical number of connections that you can sustain, basically, yeah. uh, that you can have an acti active relationship with. Uh, there's all sorts of additions to that. Uh, and it comes down to how often do you interact, uh, how close do you sit, and, and so on. So the actual number uh, in, in this kind of settings is more, it's closer to 80, I would say. Closer to 80? Uh, well, well, if yeah. you, yeah. That's great. I, and I know that there are a lot of organizations, manufacturing in particular, that uh, if they're really uh, focused on that, they won't allow their manufacturing plants to even grow more than 150 employees. 
uh, they'll just open a new plant. As soon as you have 150 employees in that plant, that plant's done, open a new plant, another 150, because you have to be able to understand the relationships and the interrelationships. So it's not only the one-to-one -one relationships. So I know how I interact with Jonas, but I know how Jonas and Matt interact as well. It's like that social system, I think. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. Thank you. I, I, was, I was wondering if, uh, quickly, so we are, we're flying through here at 736, and I'd love to get some questions from the audience soon. But uh, before we jump into the audience, and, and Amy has a microphone for any of you guys who would like to, to jump in and ask a question. Uh, so get ready for that. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll go out to you guys. Uh, overall, the culture at Spotify, I know when I walk into the, to the environment, when we walk through uh, and see the employees working together, uh, it seems like a great place to work. It seems like a lot of fun. Can you guys just talk briefly about uh, how you create that culture, what that culture is, what it means to you all working here? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, well, we're a music company. Uh, <laughs> it's a very musical environment. Yeah, we, <laughs> Perfectly so, timed. Yeah, we, uh, we love music, and that's something that really drives a, a lot of people's reasons for choosing Spotify over another place to work. And um, the other things that we really we really value, because we can't, you can't articulate culture, um, but we can, I can talk about what we do value, and we really value autonomy, we value feedback, honesty, respect, uh, challenges, learning. These are things that we talk about all the time. And we have, um, we have a, a cultural interview that everyone goes through to just kind of assess whether or not this is the right place for you, whether or not your skills complement the team. We, 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 all, we try to make sure, you know, we don't want everyone at Spotify to be the same because that would be a terrible place to work and we wouldn't be innovative at all. And so we assess people through that. And then we have, um, we have a boot camp where we, we actually do retrospectives every day and we actually talk about what we, we like and what we're learning and how we want to work together for about a week, every day a half hour, just when you're joining with other new joiners. It helps people understand what the, the values we have are. Um, we have a list of four, but my favorite one that we that they're on the walls. Everyone has stickers. Is think it, build it, ship it, tweak it, because Spotify is also about constant improvement, and we are really, really open to feedback about change. I mean, we talk about tweak it all the time, and even though Agile is more present in in the tech organization. Think it, build it, ship it, tweak it goes through everyone. And there's always an understanding that it, you're free to try things and you're free to fail because you're not going to sink the ship most of the time. And, um, and you, can, you can make changes. Great. Are there questions out there for our panel? Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, so, you know, so, so it seems like the, the organization is basically broken down into, into a lot of individual groups. Uh, am, am I right in assuming that? So is there a separate, a special effort made to instill a overarching Spotify culture so that, so that even though everyone's sort of autonomous, there's still a, a unified um, culture? Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, there is. So um, <clears throat> within our sort of broader, wider HR org, we have a, an employee employee, uh, employee engagement group that do exactly that. Um, there's four or five, I think, people in that group now, maybe a little bit more. One of them's over there, Kate. Uh, yes. Hey, Kate. Um, who who do exactly what you uh, were asking. Um, they look at the broader the broader culture, that how we socialise, how we integrate, how we uh, communicate. Um, our sort of cultural DNA, the values that we that we adhere to and, and promote and, and hire against. I mean, one example is Hack Week, uh, because we value trying things and and being wild and crazy about ideas and being honest and taking time to learn. Like that was from Daniel X, CEO. Everyone participated. Each of the people on the lead team put out a specific business problem related to their part of the organization and asked everyone to take a stab at trying it and then and really shared challenges that way and shared that we believe that that's, that's important. Great. I'm just gonna jump in here for a second since I have the mic. Yes. Um, so I'm curious about the professional development 
<clears throat> approach and how you identify what to focus on um, and maybe you can provide a couple of examples of some of the initiatives that you have around that. Um, all right, let's see if I can uh, explain this. So around pro professional development, we, uh, we look at it uh, from a few different angles. Uh, one thing, uh, one quite big thing is, is trying to move uh, people within the organization. Uh, I moved over here four months ago, uh, which has been uh, great fun. Uh, uh, <laughs> you sound so, so enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, but it, it has been. Trust me, he loves his job. I yeah. know he loves uh, his job. Uh, but also moving people within the depo within departments, uh, across departments, uh, and that could be short term or, or long term. Uh, I would say that's that, that's one of the the key strategies. Uh, another one has been to um, we, we don't do titles that much. Uh, but we do have a system uh, where people can uh, voluntarily choose to to take like an add-on to their uh, current job. So they uh, could choose to be a public speaker, for instance. Um, so they uh, they take on the add-on. They go out to different conferences and and talk about what they do at Spotify and, and, and well, just sharing their their knowledge. Uh, at conferences, and then we have things like mentors and, and coaches uh, within the organization, and we also have a, a trainer add-on, which is basically someone who uh, who, who gives uh, classes on, on different things. And we've done this both internally and externally. So we actually had in Stockholm a uh, Cassandra course that only were, that was only for external people. Uh, that, that it was free, and we uh, we we. We want to share sort of the knowledge that we that we have. Cassandra being a, a database. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Cassandra is a database, not something else. <laughs> Can I add one thing too? I'm not. Uh, but we also for like our reviews process. Um, instead of having a scheduled review with your manager, uh, we hope that people have them twice a year. But Jonas has worked really hard on a new process where your review is completely separate from any salary discussions, but. Any, the discussion is focused on professional development and you and your manager spend concerted time talking about what your needs might be and how you can get to the next place in Spotify or elsewhere if that's what you think is best for you. And then we're collecting a lot of the information from that and best we can to identify larger training needs. It sounds like it's very consistent with the theme that you're, you, you're bringing up about uh, servant leadership and leaders as support. So the question is, do you do 360 feedback? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how, how to, to answer this. So the new uh, um, performance development uh, process that we have is completely voluntary. Uh, and you can choose to, to uh, ask for feedback from anyone. And you can give feedback on anyone. So it, it's not very formalized. It's it's supposed to be about you and your development, and you own it, and you get to drive it. And if you don't want to do it, fine. That's um, it's up to you. I, I'm not sure. Did I answer your question or? So you talked a lot about the, the honesty, the feedback. So within the performance review. So if you're looking at talent development, personal development, how are you incorporating? Are you incorporating? Or how are you incorporating the feedback about how people are working together? So the question is, how do you incorporate feedback into the talent development and career progression process? Well, and hopefully people are giving each other feedback regularly. Jonas actually leads feedback trainings, and it's something that we talk about as important in everyday work. Uh, as an agile company, we do retrospectives at the end of every sprint or retrospectives at the end of any big project, and people are really honest then, and that's where we start tweaking things. But if you want to talk and do a 360 review, the new process says at any time you can start that. But we, um, we hope that the people that are at Spotify value that and do start that, and that managers encourage that and, and encourage people to get support when they need it. Uh, and just to extend that, within the, the technology and product organization, like the, uh, the, 
the squad and, and tribe model we spoke about before. Um, the, the hiring manager for a developer, for, for example, is, is the chapter lead. Um, so that, that hiring manager looks after all of the, the front end developers, for example. But the, the, one of the primary responsibilities of, of that chapter, the, or the chapter model, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the chapter lead, as it's called, uh, is to actually focus in on the, the career development and the professional development of, of each of the people within their, their chapter. Um, and that's an ongoing conversation. It's very iterative, it's very, it's, the evolution's there all the time. So every time they, they both formally and informally uh, catch up, um, there's the, the professional development is always there. And it's, um, I think we realized like, like a lot of companies a long time ago that professional development doesn't have to be about a move up to management. Some people aren't interested in moving into management. Um, it could be a lateral move. It could be, as uh, Jonas mentioned about the, the add-on um, uh, component that we have here, which is basically kind of bolting additional skills onto your sort of existing skill set or set of experiences. Um, and so it's, it's, I guess there's a, uh, it's a, almost like a three-dimensional um, um, model of, of how you can kind of grow within the company and it doesn't have to be up or directly across, it could be out or, or a move or, yeah. So just one final addition here, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this uh, new uh, performance development uh, process was, uh, is actually quite a good example of how we work together with HR. Uh, HR did actually, well, they did 98% of the job to, uh, getting this new process in place. Uh, and and we, we helped uh, answering some questions. So, yeah, and sent, sent the email. So everyone, <laughs> everyone thought it was us who did all the work. Good job, HR, those of you who are here. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, so strong cultures are frequently defined as much by what they exclude as by what they include. So I'm curious, other than a lack of interest in music, what are qualities that indicate to you that somebody might not be a fit here? So you would, you would, uh, you said, I think Becky said that you have kind of an assessment and you go through behaviors before uh, you bring people into the company to make sure that they're a strong fit for the culture. And so the question is not only what do you include. In, in people that you bring into the culture, what is something that would say, hey, this isn't a good fit but for us or for you uh, before people join the organization? Well, something that we actively look for is, is the talented jerks. Uh, we, we have very high standards when it comes to hiring people and most of the assessment is, is around skill uh, but we don't, we don't want to hire people who are very good at what they do but can't work together with other, other people. Uh, so, I mean, we have done it uh, at times. It hasn't, <laughs> hasn't necessarily worked out that well. Uh, so that's something that we actively look for. How do you, how do you assess that in an interview, for instance? Uh, well, we ask about uh, what they've done previously and, and try to go into specific details and how they work together in teams or, or not, uh, what their achievements was and, and sort of how they communicate around that. So how do they talk about specific instances and behaviors in the past and you try to see if they're talking about themselves or the team or ways in which they've worked together? Yeah, because it, the best way to, to predict future behavior is to look at past behavior. We'll also uh, often ask a, a candidate to provide um, uh, like a theoretical example of how they would approach a particular s situation to sort of, um, and it's not about getting necessarily the correct answer, it's about the thought process and, mm -hmm. and, and how they actually uh, approach the problem, um, in particular to uh, collaboration is in terms of if we, we might ask an engineer or an agile coach like how they would go about like sharing what they're up to or, or sharing an idea or uh, communicating a problem that they've got. Um, and it's less about sort of, uh, it's more about how they sort of approach the, the mentality of, or the, um, the need of, of uh, collaborating, collaborating with other, uh, their peers or other people within the team. Great, I think we have time for uh, one more. Uh, this woman right here, uh, how about, we take a couple more, you guys have time? Okay, so, yeah, we, we, at 7.50 we were good. We have the space? Yeah, large space. Let's keep the party going. Keep the party going. We're here till midnight. So. <laughs> um, so how do you approach efficiency in your reputation and uh, transparency in the recruiting process? Like when you have to turn people down or 
um, you know, but still make it a positive experience? How do you kind of approach that? I can start. Um, so uh, broadly across the company, we have a very strong culture of, of uh, respect um, and uh, uh, of respect for other people and, and uh, honesty and, and, uh, and transparency. So uh, we, within the recruiting practice itself, um, we try very hard to be very personalised, um, very uh, uh, like a lot of attention to detail. Um, we have uh, an amazing recruiting team that spend a lot of time and effort um, making sure that as many people that come through the doors here as possible have a, a positive experience, regardless of the outcome of of their their interview or their, their uh, the job that they're seeking. Um, and we'll often provide um, uh, feedback. If someone was unsuccessful, for example, we'd provide feedback as, as to why we didn't think it was a good fit. Uh, we we won't go into a lot of detail, of course. Um, it, uh, but we'll often often like make a, a, a considerable effort to. to a, let them know promptly. We have a, a, an SLA of, of 24 hours um, if, we're, um, if we're pretty clear that someone isn't a good fit for, for different reasons. Um, we get back to them, we, we'll make sure we, we call them first. If we, and we Several attempts, if we can't call them, we'll, we'll email them as a, as a, a backup. But we want to make sure that um, regardless of what your uh, experience here at Spotify, but it, it's quick, it's friendly, it's professional, and it's respectful. Anecdotally, I did not get the first job I applied to at Spotify, and <laughs> it was a great experience still, and I came back. That's great. Kept bugging Matt. And also, it's, it's not just about us finding people that we want to hire. We, we need to uh, make sure that they want to work here as well. So we try to be as, as open, as transparent, as we possibly can during the interview process and say, hey, you know what, uh, these are the things that we do well, these are the things, things that sucks. Uh, if you're not interested in helping with that, you're probably not gonna enjoy this. Uh, so, and, and some people say, you know what, I'll, I'll try my chances elsewhere. And that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, we, we, we look for people who can help us grow the, the organization. We don't want people who wanna just come here and, and come in at nine o'clock and leave at five and just do their job. We want people who are passionate about helping us grow and evolve as, a, as an organization and that'll uh, improve the workplace for everybody and ultimately improve the product and, and just everything about Spotify that exists. So. Great. Um, right here in front. Oh. Yeah. So you mentioned that your roles have sort of evolved as you move from focusing on recruiting to management to professional development. And it seems like those are probably reactions to the specific needs of the New York office. I'm curious how much you try to create a consistent experience between the Swedish office, between here, other offices, and sort of what the challenges are that come with that. So uh, this uh, cycle uh, happened first in the Stockholm office. Uh, and I would say that the New York office was, was uh, one or one and a half years behind so we, we saw it coming and, and uh, started staffing up the the people operations uh, team here well uh, um, yeah, yeah. No. so to, I think the next part of your question was how do we keep a consistent thing so we mentioned before about the um, employee engagement team that, that do a lot of work and a lot of spend a lot of time and effort um, uh, creating con a consistent um, set of values and, and uh, I guess by an extension of that, a, a certain culture that we um, that we have. Um, but it is largely value driven. Um, like th there's a, some common elements to how the offices look and feel and things like that. But it's, I mean, they're trivial in the grand scheme of things. It's it's more about how we treat each other, how we communicate, um, how we stay aligned as a company. Um, and if we don't if we don't treat each other well and, and professionally and, and respectful, then we're, we're not. We're, able to sustain this over a longer period of time, so. To give a concrete example, Paulo's actually here this week working with me because we share um, a large role in the activation phase of, of people, life, of the employee life cycle at Spotify, and so we're working on a couple of improvements that we think are really high priority right now together here, and when we separate, for example, we both run our boot camp onboarding program the Stockholm program is not the same as the one in New York because we have different cultures, different types of teams in the different offices. 
but we touch base once a week and just talk about what worked this week, what didn't work this week, what did you learn? And our entire people operations team meets a few times a year just to kind of go over that and make sure that we understand the challenges and priorities that people have and that we we address them equally and fairly. And all of the information that we can possibly have on the wiki that we use for a lot of our internal communications is there. And you're not going to see something that says, well, in Stockholm we do this, in New York we do this, unless it's an integral difference. We just try to be consistent through communication. I know that one of the places where you guys think about this a lot for the smaller offices, so Stockholm and New York are the largest, uh, but to, to really help and support some of your smaller offices, that sounded like it was a bigger challenge sometimes. Yeah, we, we have a, um, so in terms of size, uh, Stockholm being the biggest um, presence when the headquarters and I guess the, the spiritual home as, as such, uh, New York being a, a close second, but we have smaller offices in, uh, in Gothenburg in, in Sweden as well, that, um, and then in San Francisco we have a very, very small team of about 15 people. Um, but some of the challenges we face there is they're not big enough to have like dedicated support structures in place from uh, business support and people operations or employee engagement. Uh, so it, it is difficult sometimes to provide them the same level of support that we do to uh, maybe the, the Stockholm in New York, for example. Um, but they're also part of our family as well, so we, we do try very hard to make sure that they they get the same access to um, support and, and, and benefits and, and the culture and the DNA and the values that we adhere to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to, to paraphrase for those of you who may be watching, uh, what are the challenges in terms of cross-cultural communication, especially given the fact that it, Spotify is a very international organization? Well, I'm the only American on our team also. <laughs> like, we, even within our team and within Spotify and Stockholm, we have people from all over Europe. And between the two offices, um, Matt can talk a little bit more about like those challenges, but we are just really clear about assumptions. I think that's like what's really important when you're talking to people from other cultures mm -hmm. is if you don't know what they're assuming and you don't know where they're coming from, you make you misunderstand things, yeah. and we try to avoid that. Um, so outside of the, I guess, the differences between Sweden and, and the US or, or Stockholm and, and uh, New York, from an office point of view, I think uh, we have a... Um, a pretty strong cultural diversity element to, to the organization. I think we have something like 68 or 72, something like that, different countries represented in the entire sort of makeup of, the, of a, a thousand or so people. Um, it's a, but more specifically to, to New York and Stockholm, which is probably a, a good example, is that um, it, there, can, there can be challenges at some time. There, is, there are some, I guess, communication sort of cultural differences between, say, uh, um, uh, Stockholm and, and New York, for example, Swedish people tend to be very polite and friendly and collaborative. Um, Americans tend not to be. As a native New Yorker, uh, so I feel very polite and collaborative. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, it's, uh, it, again, it comes back to the values. We, um, uh, thankfully, um, everyone in, in Sweden can speak perfect English, um, often better than I can. Uh, but um, it's, it's how we treat each other. Um, and so the cultural differences, while they uh, can be obvious at times, but they're um, at, at the same time, at the same time, they're also quite trivial in the grand scheme of how we operate as a, as a company. And Google Hangouts. Yes, <laughs> we re rely heavily on Google and their, and their Hangouts. I feel like I have not been going over there, so you're over my right shoulder, it's harder. Uh, we'll have two questions there, yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, so um, you talked a bit about your uh, think it, build it, ship it, tweak it, and I think very similar to a lot of other startups and people in this space, um, there's a very, an openness to failure and try, and if it tanks, that's fine. I was wondering if you'd be comfortable sharing any of your failed attempts and how you've turned it around. So I, I, can, I can share one, one of my favorites. Uh, so back in 2011, when we uh, integrated with Facebook, uh, this was, a, internally, this was a huge deal because we'd never really had deadlines before we 
we never announced anything. It was when it was done, it was done, and we shipped it, and everything was fine. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> Facebook comes along and says, you know what, we're going to present this at this date. Uh, so that created s somewhat of the, I don't want to call it panic, but I don't know any other <laughs> word. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, people in the lead team w wanted to try new things to sort of motivate people uh, as, the, as the deadline <laughs> uh, came closer. and. Um, and then they wanted to try uh, some sort of bonus system for uh, for the de development team. And uh, well, we had some fruitful discussions, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and we ended up with two separate uh, suggestions that we wanted to try. Uh, so we decided to try this, try the first one for I think it was three weeks. Uh, and then uh, evaluate, and then try the other one for three weeks, and then evaluate that. So, what we tried was um, it was uh, you could give everyone could give three tokens of appreciation to to anyone within the development team, and the only thing you needed to do was uh, to write one sentence to why you wanted to do this. Why do you want to give this to Matt? Uh, and, and he would get one token. And then at the end of the three weeks, uh, each token that you had received would uh, translate into a, a dollar amount. Uh, so this, this would mean money. Uh, no one would lose money on this. Everyone would win, uh, if, you, if you got a token at least. Um, and we did this for three weeks and uh, did an evaluation and people were I, it was an outrage. People <laughs> hated this. No one liked. It. Well, some people liked it, but it was it was a disaster. So, <laughs> so we 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 spend a lot of money on making people angry, uh, <laughs> and 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 spending time on and discussing this uh, amongst themselves. So so this was such a disaster with, that we canceled the second. Uh, uh, <laughs> try and then we we bought a bunch of cakes. Uh, <laughs> Cake so, makes everything better. <laughs> no, and and specifically it said that you know what we're we're having cake today because we tried, we failed, but we tried, and and that's uh, we we tried. So now we have data that <laughs> that we can use to to not do this again. Uh, so it was an interesting uh, experience, I would say. Uh, so we'll have our one last question here. Hi. Before I ask my question, I don't think um, how, how many people are in the New York office. I don't think we've talked about the size of your company uh, at, at all. So there's a, uh, roughly a, about a thousand people uh, globally. Uh, in New York is around to 250, 300. And, and on the engineering team or the development uh, about team? About 150. It's about 150. half. So my question goes. Um, back to the organizational structure, and I'm wondering how it's decided um, what squads people are on. Is it a self-organized thing? Are people assigned to it? And then within that, is there, uh, are there guidelines of mobility to go uh, between the squads? Uh, all of the above. Um, it's, uh, sometimes we have prioritized roles that we're, we're looking to fill, um, so that they're occasionally, but not often, there might be a um, we might interview someone for a specific role within a specific squad, for example. Um, but often what will happen is a, as they come through the interview process, the, the various hiring managers or the um, squads will be involved in the interview process or at least the calibration uh, beyond the, the, the interview or the, or the offer. Um, and we'll look to sort of uh, place that, that person into a, a team or a squad where we think it's, it's a, a good fit, um, both in terms of skill set, personality, um, needs of the of the or the desires of the the new employee, um, so it, it can vary quite a lot. But it's we we do spend a lot of time and energy making sure that we are uh, strategic about um, and care about where we where we place people to start with to um, to align with their needs as well. To give a quick example, so we have an all hands meeting every Friday at four thirty where everyone in tech has some beer, eats some cookies, and we make announcements about events like this. Um, but we also have open announcements, and our product owner from Social a couple weeks ago actually made an announcement trying to convince people that they should get passionate about his challenges and talk to their 
chapter leads about moving onto the social team because they have a need right there right now. And so it's totally voluntary and no one's gonna force anyone to switch squads. One of the great things about our structure is that squads are fairly stable, so people have really strong relationships. But if someone was looking for a challenge, he was ready with one for them. And so people can really just make those kinds of announcements. And I, I don't think we really have a feeling of like, oh no, you're stealing my engineer, because we're pretty good about believing that we're one big team, I think. Yeah, that, that is true. And we, we also talk very openly and honestly about um, your next job will, should be at Spotify. Um, so we, we want to encourage people to look for other opportunities or ways to develop or, or learn or grow that um, means they can move within the company or to a different team or chapter or tribe. Um, and, and that's openly discussed and, and openly promoted and we, we sort of uh, promote that, that, that part of our culture and our values. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, Matt, Jonas, Becky, really appreciate this. Thank you for hosting us here. And uh, thank you all for, for showing up for the last 12 months. And I hope to see you guys again uh, soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.